Welcome. In this session, we'll learn how to calculate free cash flow. You may be wondering what are the free cash flows, but we understand in intrinsic valuation, we use free cash flows to determine firm value and equity value. But free cash flow, what is it? And how do we calculate it? And what is the implication of free cash flow to firm valuation and to equity valuation? These are the things we are going to cover. So follow me. Welcome. You can refer to my book, Corporate Evaluation and Practical Approach with the Case Studies, published by Springer. It is available as a hardcover, soft tea cover, as well as a book. So let's talk about the cash flow concepts. We're going to start with the cash flow operations and it will be referring to operating activities. And then we'll talk about free cash flow and we'll be relating it to investing activities as well as operating activities. And we'll talk about free cash flow to the firm and the implication on financing activities, as well as free cash flow to equity and the implication on financing activities. Which means we have four different cash concepts. Think about your company and how it generates its cash. And I would like to start with cash revenue from operations. Cash come in and out of a company from business operations. It may be from sales, and we we'll be referring to key or core business operations of a company. What is next? Then we have the cash from operations, which means cash revenue from operations, taking care operating expenses, including taxes, but not interest expenses. We understand in calculating net income, interest expenses are deducted, but they are not actually operating expenses. They are financing expenses. So we'll see what does it imply later on in the concept of free cash flow. Then we take care of working capital expenditure. That is current assets and current liabilities. Working capital simply means current assets minus current liabilities. By doing so, we have cash flow operations. And then think about what other activities. From cash from operations, we take care of fixed capital expenditure. And we are referring to expenditure on fixed capital relating to core activities of a company. And this is because by investing in those assets, we'll be able to use them to generate more cash. So in short, free cash flow is simply cash from operations deducting fixed capital expenditure. And then we move to free cash flow to the firm. Cash from operations is just operations. Free cash flow is operations and investing. 
we remain with financing aspect. So to start, free cash flow to the firm is free cash flow excluding the effect of leverage. And here we are talking about interest expenses. Earlier I mentioned that in calculating net income, interest expenses are deducted, but it is not operating expense. It is a financing expense. So to bring it back, it should be excluded by adding it. Another financing aspect is preference dividend. It is nowhere considered in calculating net profit because dividends are paid after profit has been realized. So if a company has preference dividend, it should be considered. Why? Because free cash flow to the firm is cash available to all investors. And we talk about all investors, we are talking about debt holders, preference shareholders, as well as common shareholders. It is therefore referred to as unlevered free cash flow. And then from that, we have free cash flow to equity. Free cash flow to equity is free cash flow to the firm after taking care the financing needs to debt holders and preference shareholders. So it includes the effect of leverage or financing generally. It is therefore referred to as levered free cash flow. And it is cash available to common shareholders. So now I'll talk about the financing implication of free cash flow, free cash flow to the firm, and free cash flow to equity. And we'll consider a situation in the absence of debt and in the absence of debt and the preference stock. In the absence of debt, free cash flow should be equal to free cash flow to the firm. And in the absence of debt and the preference stock, everything should be the same. Free cash flow is simply free cash flow to the firm and it is free cash flow to equity because everything belongs to equity shareholders. And therefore, these different types of free cash flows will have implication on valuation. Free cash flow and free cash flow to the firm can be used to value a firm discounted at the appropriate cost of capital. But normally free cash flow should be applied if a company does not have debt. And free cash flow to the firm if a company has debt. Free cash flow to equity is applicable to value equity discounted at the appropriate cost of equity. Please subscribe to my channel, like and share to get notification and more insight from these lessons by clicking the button below this screen. Now, how do we calculate free cash flows? Before we talk about calculating free cash flows, we need to understand some few things. First, 
that free cash flows are calculated from financial statements. And therefore, we should know the financial statements. We should know the compositions of those financial statements and what did they imply. We should know the difference between balance sheet information, income statement information, and the cash flow statement information. And this is because we need to determine which items to be included in calculating free cash flows. Remember, free cash flow does not mean cash balance that we see in the balance sheet or a net cash in the cash flow statement. And as we have seen, there are three different types of free cash flow concepts. So we can calculate free cash flows by combining information from two financial statements in pair. You can have a pair of income statement and balance sheet, or we can have a pair of income statement and cash flow statement. But we have to take note that using pair one and pair two does not necessarily mean having the same results because mismatches between balance sheet and the cash flow statements tend to arise. We also have to take note that financial reporting styles tend to differ. We take financial statements from different sources and the companies present financial statements based on different financial reporting formats or standards. Some are presented based on general accepted accounting principles, some of them based on international financial reporting standards. And the details included in the financial statements can differ from one source to another. To be able to calculate free cash flows for the purpose of valuation, we need detailed financial statements from which we can understand clearly the nature of activities of a company and which items should be included in calculating the free cash flows. It's also important to take note of the meanings of signs in the financial statements because the meanings tend to differ depending on the sources of the financial statements. For example, a negative sign could mean deduct or it could mean cash outflow or it could mean expense. A positive sign could mean add or it could mean cash inflow. For example, in some financial statements, a negative sign is put in front of accumulated depreciation in the balance sheet, but it does not mean negative accumulated depreciation. It simply means deduct accumulated depreciation from gross property, plant, and equipment. And because we calculate free cash flows using tools like Excel, these signs matter a lot before we apply. Otherwise, we could have wrong signs in Excel and the results can be misleading. Another important thing to take note is to understand the company from which we use the financial statements to calculate free cash flows and the company which we intend to value. The reason why we need to understand the company is because we are trying to be forward looking as much as we can. These free cash flows are calculated from historical financial statements, but we expect to use them to predict the future of the company and even to estimate the expected growth rate by extrapolating the historical free cash flow performance of a company.
we need to know the nature of business. And this will help determine fixed capital expenditure and nature of business operations. Why do we need this? Is because sometimes we have to determine which items relating to fixed, ex fixed capital expenditure to be included in calculating free cash flow and which items relating to nature of business operations to be included as well. For example, a company like Ecopetrol, a oil and gas extraction company, has a significant amount of capital intensity in its fixed capital expenditure. It is not like an online retailer like Amazon. So the definition of property plant and equipment can differ from one company to another depending on how capital intensity a company is. So what should be included as fixed capital expenditure in Ecopetrol can be different from what should be defined as fixed capital expenditure for Amazon. Similarly, we need to know what are the core business activities because free cash flows are calculated from core business activity. And core business activities reflect the type of expectations we have on the company in terms of growth of cash flows, risk, et cetera. And the reason is because we need to be forward looking. We cannot put expectations on non-core business activities. Also, we need to consider recurring items. Some companies may have items in terms of business operations as well as capital expenditure that are not expected to recur. So we have to carefully identify what are the recurring items. And in case of an item considered to be non-recurring, should not be included in calculating the free cash flow. Not because we don't want them to appear in the free cash flows of the current period or the historical period, but because we need to reflect in the future. Recurrence means we expect the future to include those items. Next question is, how do we calculate the free cash flows? There are many methods to calculate free cash flows. The way we start and the way we end. The good thing is that no matter how we start and no matter what method we use or what formula we use, the outcome should be the same. And this is because the definition and the meaning of the free cash flows should be consistently applied. For now, I'm going to talk about the overall approach. I prefer this because it is an approach in which we can calculate all different types of free cash flows at once. And the good thing is that with this approach, most of the information come from cash flow statement. So combining cash flow statement being the main source and some of the information from balance sheet and income statement, we should be able to calculate all the different types of free cash flows by applying this approach. How do we start? It starts with net income, which can be obtained from income statement and cash flow statement of the most current period. Then from net income, what do we need to do? We need to add non-cash charges. These non-cash charges include depreciation, amortization, gains or losses, investment, deferred taxes, and so on. 
Why do we add them? It is because they are non-cash items, but they were included in the calculating net income. So we had to remove them. And of course, we consider them as recurring items. Remember, financial statements are prepared on a cruel basis of accounting. So revenues or sales are recognized even if no cash is received. And expenses are recognized when incurred even if nothing is paid. So as long as we don't use cash basis of accounting, not everything is cash. And net income or net profit does not necessarily imply cash. So what is next? Next, we add or deduct change in working capital. And here, we consider working capital excluding cash and the cash equivalent in current assets and excluding interest bearing liabilities in current liabilities. Cash and the cash equivalent are considered as non-operating. That's why they are excluded here. And interest bearing current assets are considered as debt from which a company pays interest. It will be reflected in net borrowing to determine free cash flow to equity. So change in working capital can be a positive change or negative change. And this information should be available from the balance sheet or cash flow statement. The balance sheet could be the difference between the current and the previous periods and the cash flow statement of the most current period. So the outcome would be cash from operations. It is also possible to obtain cash from operations by simply taking the figure from cash flow statements without necessarily starting from net income, but proceeding towards calculating free cash flow, which is our next target. To calculate free cash flow, we need to deduct fixed capital expenditure. And as I said earlier, depending on the nature of business, we consider fixed capital expenditure on core business activity. It is a cash outflow, therefore it is deducted. It can be obtained from the cash flow statement of the current period or the balance sheet. That means a change between the current period and the previous period. From free cash flow, we now target free cash flow to the firm. We add net interest expense and we add preference dividend. Net interest expense is added because it was deducted in calculating net income, but it is not an operating expense. It is a financing expense. It is net because it takes into account the effect of tax. We understand that interests reduce tax bills. And this is a question of interest tax yield, which should be considered in valuation. So net interest expenses increase cash available to debt holders. It is therefore added. The same implication is on preference dividend, which is a fixed claim on the preference share financing component. It is not tax deductible, but it is treated the same way as interest expenses. It is added to increase cash available to all investors. And that's the meaning of free cash flow to the firm. That is cash available to all investors. Then what is next? Our next target is free cash flow 
to equity. To start from free cash flow to the firm, we deduct net interest expenses. Our aim is to reach what is remaining to common equity holders. So we deduct it to reduce cash available to common equity holders. The same is applying to preference dividend. We reduce cash available to common equity holders. What is next? Next, we add net borrowing. Net borrowing reflects cash outflow, that is debt deduction, and cash inflow, that is debt issuance. It increases or reduces cash available to common shareholders. It is added. And we are talking about a change. It can be a positive or negative change. Next is net preference stock. Preference stock are like that because in determining the cash available to common shareholders, we add them for the increased cash available to common shareholders. We should understand in the highlight in which cash is distributed the common shareholders as the last ones. After meeting all investing activities, the next is to pay debt. And when cash is available, something will go to preference shareholders and whatever remains will be to the common shareholders. If nothing remains, they'll get nothing. So that will give us free cash flow to equity. That is cash available to common shareholders. So after grasping the concept of free cash flows, let us recap. We have three different types of free cash flows. Free cash flow, which simply means cash flow operations deducting capital expenditure. And then free cash flow to the firm. That means free cash flow after excluding the effect of leverage and financing to preference shareholders. And then free cash flow to equity, that is cash available to equity shareholders. So let us now see how we can apply these concepts to calculate the free cash flows based on the financial statement of a company. And in this case, we'll use Eco Petrol Company, a Colombian company, who I will show the information from the balance sheet income statement as well as the cash flow statement, but our focus financial statement will be the cash flow statement. And therefore, in conjunction with information from income statement and the balance sheet, we'll be able to calculate the free cash flows of that company using the approach that I've just described. So let's proceed. Please do not forget to subscribe to my channel, like and share. Click notification button to be notified of any updates or new lessons whenever they arise. So we have the three financial statements of Ecopetrol SA. In Colombian pesos, our financial statements have been extracted from 2009 to 2021. The balance sheet is standardized and we have the cash flow statement standardized and the income statement adjusted. So we'll have the free cash flows calculated from 2009 to 2021 because we can use the historical cash flows to extrapolate average growth if we wish. We'll learn later on how to estimate the growth rate. I have prepared a template and this template is based on the approach that I've described earlier. We'll start with net income, we'll add non-cash charges, we'll deduct change none 
cash working capital to arrive at free cash flow, I mean cash from operations, who will deduct fixed capital expenditure to obtain free cash flow, will add net interest expenses and add preference dividend to determine free cash flow to the firm, will deduct net interest expense and deduct preference dividend and add net borrowing and add preference stock to determine free cash flow to equity. But we need to understand something else relating to net interest expenses. Net interest expenses simply means interest expenses adjusted for tax effect. That is a tax saving. So it simply means interest expenses times one minus effective tax rate. So which simply means we need first to calculate the effective tax rate. The effective tax rate is simply equal to income tax divided by pre-tax income. Where do we get that information? We get that information from the income statement. So let's first go to the income statement to identify the effective tax rate variables. That is pre-tax income and income tax. This is the income statement. In the bottom, we'll find that item. I have highlighted it to save time. We have income tax, expenses of benefit, expense is a positive number and the benefit is a negative number. We should denote that. And this is what I was talking about earlier about the use of signs in the financial statements. And we have pre-tax income or loss. Income is positive and the loss should be negative. Remember our objective here is to determine effective tax rate for the purpose of measuring the deductibility or tax saving on interest expenses. So if we have a negative uh, effective tax rate, it means nothing in terms of uh, tax savings. So we'll assume zero. In one of my lessons, I will explain the implication of this when calculating the cost of debt. So please refer to my lesson on the cost of debt to understand the concept of negativity in effective tax rate for the purpose of estimating the cost of capital. But for now, I'll focus on simply taking the income tax expense divided by pre-tax income. So let's go back to our template. That will be equal income tax expense divided by pre-tax income. It is a percentage, so we indicate a percentage sign, and therefore we'll copy this formula throughout the data to obtain all the results. And as I said earlier, a negative effective tax rate does not imply anything in terms of tax saving. So we are going to use zero in this particular purpose, but refer to my video on cost of debt to get the insight about that. So net income, net income, where do we find it? We can find it from the cash flow statement in the top of the cash flow statement as highlighted here. And we can find it in the bottom of income statement as highlighted here. So whatever we use, there's no problem. So in this case, I will apply the one from the cash flow statement because I've decided to use the cash flow statement as the main source of my calculation data. So it's equal net income 2009, that is the beginning of our calculation. Then what is next? What is next is add non-cash charges. As we said, non-cash charges can be 
depreciation amortization, and any other non-cash charges. In this case, we find them from the operating section of the cash flow statement. We have many items here in the cash flow operations. One of them is depreciation amortization and another one is non-cash items. In this company, we have non-cash items defined as def deferred income taxes as well as other non-cash items adjusted in. In some financial statements, they could be more. So try to check which items are actually included in non-cash items and try to consider the items that you expect they will be recurring. So in this case, it will be depreciation and amortization plus non-cash items. So we take that into our template by just saying that to be equal depreciation amortization plus non-cash items. And what is next? What is next is to deduct and change in non-cash working capital. We know it can be a positive or negative change and that as well should be obtained from the cash flow statement in the cash from operating activities. In this case, it is defined as change in non-cash working capital. And it includes account receivable, inventories, accounts payable and others. So it excludes cash. And the, therefore we'll take that item. We have signs, positive signs, and negative signs to reflect cash in and cash out. And therefore that takes care, the add as well as the deduct sign in our formula. So we'll simply equal say equal to change in non-cash working capital. And then we'll obtain free cash I mean cash from operations, sorry, by simply taking net income, add non-cash charges, add or deduct change in non-cash working capital because the financial statement has negative and positive signs. So a positive sign means if it's a negative, it will be deducted and if it's a positive, it will be added. Deduct fixed capital expenditure. Where do we get fixed capital expenditure? In this case, we use the cash flow statement. Which section of the cash flow statement? The investing activities section. We have several items in investing activities, including intangible assets, other investments, long-term investment, and different types of investments. We are only focusing on core, activities. In this case, the core activity is defined as acquisition of fixed productive assets. In some financial statements, the common name used is PPE or property plant and equipment. So try to understand how it is defined depending on the nature of the business of the company. In this case, these financial statements are obtained from Bloomberg and they prefer to use a name that reflects commodity among different companies. So acquisition of fixed productive assets can be property uh, plant and equipment or something else, but for core business activity. So we'll take that one. The sign is negative throughout in this particular case. It simply means they take cash out of the company because they are being acquired. In that case, it equal to acquisition of fixed productive assets. What is next? Next is to calculate free cash flow by simply taking cash from operations and deduct fixed capital expenditure. Our next target is to find 
free cash flow to the firm. We add net interest expense and preference dividend for the reasons that interest expenses were deducted in calculating net income and the preference dividend were not taken care in calculating net income. Objective is to find cash available to all investors. All right, so interest expenses, where do we find them? Income statement. So let's go to the income statement. This is the income statement. And we have, sorry, this is the income statement. I highlighted the interest expense here. And I would like you to take note that we also have interest expense net. Interest expense net is not what we use because net means interest expense minus interest income. Our objective is to measure interest expense to reflect our debt, not interest income. So it simply means net interest expense is not as interest expense net. And this is a question now of understanding how the financial statements are reported. We need to study to understand the meanings of those items so that we don't use incorrect items. They could be presented differently. So what is important is simply to know what exactly do we need. What we need here is simply interest expense. So that will be adjusted for taxes to reflect tax shield or tax savings on interest should be equal to interest expense times one minus effective tax rate. Interest expense times bracket one minus the effective tax rate that we calculated earlier. What is next? Preference dividend. Do we have preference dividend in this company? Let's find out. Some companies tend to have, some com companies not. Most companies don't. So in this company, we can find whether the company has preference dividend or not. First, we can look at the balance sheet to see if we have preference stocks. In this company, I highlighted preference equity and hybrid capital from the balance sheet. It is zero throughout, which simply means this company does not utilize preference stocks. So we expect preference dividend to be zero. But in the income statement, we can also confirm that dividend should be paid after net income. So after net income in the income statement, on preference dividend, we have zero. This company does not have preference dividend. Some companies may have. So we'll put that in our template so as to reflect that there is no preference dividend equal income statement preference dividend zero what is next we calculate free cash flow to the firm by taking free cash flow add net interest expense, add preference dividend. Is next. Next, we target free cash flow to equity. What do we have to do? We deduct net interest expense. Why? Because we need to reduce the amount of cash available to common shareholders. The same applicable to preference dividend. Equal net interest expense, that was positive. Now it is going to be negative to reflect deducting. And preference dividend, the same. If it was positive, it should be negative to reflect reducing cash available to common shareholders. Next, we add net borrowing. 
the difference between cash in from debt and debt repayment. In the cash flow statement, it can have different names, but in this case, it is referred to as, we find it in the financing activities section of the cash flow statement. And as we can see, we have several items. Our focus is on cash obtained from borrowing and repayment of debt. In this case, I highlighted it. It is referred to as cash from or repayment of debt. It can have a different name from other sources. So we need to understand which names do they use, particularly for which item. So in this aspect, we are only concerned about how much the company received from debt and what it paid. So the difference between in and out relating to debt cash movement. That's why you can see we have positive uh, signs to mean more cash received from debt and negative sign that more paid to debt holders in that particular period of time. So the plus or minus sign is taken care with those signs from the cash flow statement. So in this case, equal, cash flow statement, financing section, cash from the payment of debt. And then add preference stock. We don't have preference stock indicated in the cash flow statement here because there is no preference stock after all. Otherwise, we could expect to see something here from increase in capital stock. They could specify whether this is preference stock or not or there could be a note reflecting that. But we have something in the balance sheet indicating that we don't have preference stock. If they were, then we could calculate a change between the current period and the previous period. In this case, the current period is 2009 and the previous period 2008. So to reflect that in the template, we simply calculate preference stock and hybrid stock in 2009 minus the previous period. So this is simply just in case the company has should be equal balance sheet equity section preference stock of the current period minus the preference stock of the previous period. And we will now obtain free cash flow to equity as equal to free cash flow to the firm, deduct net interest expense, deduct preference dividend, add net borrowing, add net preference stock. I can now highlight the key free cash flow concept and the cash flow concept. So I'm going to use a highlight for that. Free cash flow to equity, free cash flow to the firm, free cash flow, as well as cash from operations. Then we will highlight and copy the formula throughout to obtain historical cash flow movement of the company. That's it all about calculating free cash flows based on this approach. So let's look at what is next. The next thing is to see what are the valuation implications of these different types of free cash flows. Which cash flow do we use for which purpose and for which type of company? Because the application will differ depending on the objective and what exactly do we want to value. Let's start with free cash flow. 
we already know what is free cash flow. We can sum that it is not all available to all investors because interest expenses were deducted in calculating operating cash flow. And that should be available to debt holders. Preference dividend was not considered at all. It should be available to preference shareholders. So it simply means free cash flow does not account for everything that should be available to all investors, but it can sometimes be applicable for firm valuation, especially if a company has a very low debt ratio or no debt at all. And in most cases, it is applicable for banks and they are not required for debt. In that case, the discount rate is not the weighted average cost of capital is simply the cost of equity because there's no debt. And the free cash flow to the firm, it has considered what should be available to debt holders and the preference shareholders. And of course, we have not deducted anything thereafter to reflect what is available to common shareholders. So it is available to all investors. And therefore it reflects the entire financing or capital structure of the company. And it is appropriate for firm valuation discounted at the weighted average cost of capital. What about free cash flow to equity? Free cash flow to the firm deducting cash needs for debt holders and preference shareholders and adding any cash in or out relating to new borrowings and new issue of preference stock. So it is available to common shareholders. It is therefore applicable to value equity and that will be discounted at the appropriate cost of equity. Refer to my other sessions on discounted free cash flows to learn more about the application of these different types of free cash flows. Although calculating free cash flow looks like a straightforward thing, but it has some complexities and the several factors affect the figure that we obtain from our calculations. And it is very important to highlight some of them so that we do not think that different analysts may come to the same figure about free cash flow. Some of the aspects can be judgmental or subjective. The numbers are the same from the same financial statements, but we can have different free cash flows. And this is something that we need to note uh, relating to any type of valuation aspect. So let's look at some of those aspects quickly. The first thing we should note is that no universe or standard definition of free cash flows, because there could be different adjustments depending on analysts' subjective judgment on what item they should include in calculating free cash flow or free cash flow to equity, as I mentioned earlier. Another important point to note is that free cash flows do not necessarily reflect the future. We expect to use them to extrapolate average growth, which we can use to predict the future of the cash flows, but they can be misleading, especially when cash flows are highly volatile. Another important point to note is that free cash flows are derived from core business operations as we have seen, and that is good because it reflects the risk and the growth expectations of a company. But some companies tend to have significant amount of uh, cash generated from non-core business activities. This is debatable whether or not that should be 
considered or not, but do they reflect the risk and the growth and the expectations on the future cash flows of the company? The answer is no. Another important point is that we consider only recurring items, but the way we define or determine recurring items can differ from one analyst to another because it is based on expectations. So we look at the history to find out whether we expect the item to recur or not. What we expect to recur may not recur and what we do not expect it to recur may recur. So it is a judgmental aspect, which is normally applicable in any type of valuation decisions. Valuation is not about number, it's not about mathematics, it's about decisions. Please subscribe down, like and share our video to gain more insight from many of our lessons by clicking the button below that screen. So we have covered the key concepts relating to free cash flows and how it can be calculated. Take note that there could be different ways in which financial statements are prepared and presented. Very important to identify and understand which items mean what and which items should or should not be included. The definitions of the items in this particular example is based on Bloomberg's source. Different sources could have different ways in which they name those items. Try to replicate the same process by calculating free cash flow of any company to see what the results you have. You can give comment if you have, you can ask questions if you have, if we, by just sharing and uh, subscribing to my channel. Thank you very much. Have a great time. I hope you enjoyed. Bye-bye.